AMD's X4A80K is its new flagship Athlon CPU, and like other Athlon CPUs in the past, it is effectively an APU with the IGP disabled. That's the internal graphics part of the die is actually off. So this is a bit different than the 7870K, 7890K in just one way, and that's the IGP, but otherwise it's sort of the same architecture, same frequency setup, same core setup, very similar overall. The main difference though for you as a consumer is that if you don't want that IGP, you can look at the Athlon series as an option, and that reduces the price to an MSRP of $95 with this X4A80K versus $165 for the 7890K and a bit lower for the 7870K. So that's what we're looking at today is basically does this thing work when paired with a DGPU? How does it compete with the APUs and how does it compete with Intel's i3? The Athlon X4 A80K uses AMD's excavator architecture, which is the last line of AMD's old architectures until Zen ships later this year. The A80K uses the FM2 Plus socket type and will generally work best for overclocking with the A88X chipset motherboards. As with all k SKU CPUs from both AMD and Intel right now, the A80K has unlocked clock rate multipliers and overclocking abilities when coupled with a chipset prepared for overclocking. The A80K is comparable to the AMD A10 7890K APU, which is a $165 chip, and the Athlon X4 A80K runs two modules and four cores, the clock rate is 4.0 to 4.2 gigahertz boosted, and the A107890K, for comparison, runs a 4.1 to 4.3 gigahertz clock rate, so it's 100 megahertz faster, and hosts eight R7 compute units with 512 streaming processors for graphics. The A80K does not have the graphics component, and that's the major difference. And it's also a 95 watt TDP chip paired with AMD's 125 watt near silent cooler. For comparison, the 7890K uses the Wraith cooler, which we reviewed previously in a full video. Our last few APU reviews have basically said that the A80K is the chip to watch out for, and it's finally here. The reason we've been saying to look out for it is because the APUs, although they're powerful in their own right, maybe for a $300 rig or something similar, it really doesn't make a lot of sense as sort of a core gamer to get an APU, even if you're on an ultra budget, because when you can spend $60 to $90 on something like this, or Intel's previously the G3258, which we no longer recommend, but when you can buy something like that and pair it with maybe even an $80 or $90 GPU, DGPU, like a 250X or 340 or something like that, the performance difference is massive and it makes a lot more sense as a gamer to go the route of a cheaper dedicated CPU and a cheaper DGPU than a more expensive single APU unit, which will generally underperform for the types of games that our audience tries to play. Even when looking at APU performance versus lower classed chips with the 250X, which is about as cheap as you can get for a reasonable DGPU or the 340 or 750 non-TI, the 250X blows the APUs away and no competition in some instances between the DGPU and the APU setup. Some of these older charts that you can see now show what you're looking at from the 7860K review and that's basically the raw power gain from even a low-end DGPU like the 250X to the APUs. And these charts don't include the A80K, but we'll get to that momentarily. We tested the A80K for gaming performance, overclocking, and thermals. And we're gonna start with thermals today. The AMD APU products are tough to get an accurate reading from. Most of the usual tools don't work or don't work well. And the per core readings are often inaccurate depending on which software you're using. So that presents a methodology challenge. Our current thermal bench for the AMD AP CPUs and APUs is limited, but it's growing with each review. And the X4 A80K with its stock heatsink runs cooler than both the 7870K and 7860K when each is paired with their stock coolers. It's a surprisingly cool chip aided by the fact that a large portion of the die, which would be the IGP components of the APU, is disabled from use. AMD's Athlon X4 A80K uses what AMD calls its 125 watt near silent or NS cooler, and that's the same as is found stock with the 7870K and 7860K. The Wraith is only found on the 7890K, which is new, and some of the FX8370 chips. For frame rate testing, we try to provoke a CPU bottleneck by pairing these lower end CPUs with a 980 Ti, and then we also pair them with a low end card like a 250X, and that's for comparison against the APUs. You can see all the charts in the article linked in the description below, but we'll go through a couple of them here. 
Provoking a CPU bottleneck helps us understand the total raw output potential of a CPU without artificial limitations imposed by other components. For just the CPU performance charts, we'll start off with Metro Last Light. Note that Metro Last Light is uniquely picky about threads and will present poor 0.1% low metrics for just about every CPU shy of those with eight available threads, like the i7 hyper-threaded CPUs. At 1080p, the Athlon X4 880K predictably performs equally to the A10 7870K, being a simplified version of the $135 7870K APU. There's a clear CPU bottleneck established when we look to the i5 6600K as a control, which pushes nearly 96 FPS average. The i3-6300, priced at $150, eats into the performance a bit with a 14.5% performance difference against the 6600K. And the Athlon X4 880K suffers a 44% performance difference when matched against the i3-6300, though the Intel CPU fairly is priced $50 higher. It doesn't make any sense really to opt for the IGP options here, the APUs, considering these first tests couple a DGPU with the CPUs, and we can see that the APUs output about equal CPU performance. They're all sort of tied with the X4 A80K, substantially cheaper than the APU options. There's no noteworthy gain over the older 760K in this particular benchmark, though that does change in a few other tests. Shadow of Mordor is one of those. The old X4 760K performs at 74 FPS average, a 13.8% difference from the new X4 A80K. The APUs fall in between these Athlon chips and the 7870K again is effectively tied. No reason really to buy that if buying a DGPU because, I mean, just looking at these benchmarks, you pretty much see why you wouldn't want the APU. It's all about the same CPU performance. The AMD devices are bottlenecking when compared to an i3-6300, again, $150, and there's a 31.7% difference between them, but the AMD devices are still exceeding 60 FPS, at 1080p with the GPU we've chosen and our reasonable gaming chips for their price. And again, to be fair, this is a worst case scenario. It's a 980 Ti, which realistically you would never pair with an 880K. Grid Autosport is one of the mo most sensitive games we have when it comes to CPU frequency and thread count changes. And without moving into the i7 range, the most powerful CPU on this bench pushes 130 FPS average in the form of the 6600K. The 6300 sees a reduction of 15.8%, but is still above the 100 FPS mark at 1080p. And then we hit a giant wall, and the AMD chips start to reemerge after the 60 FPS range. The X4 760K sits at 59 FPS and is championed by the 880K with a 9.6% delta. Massive bottleneck overall, but if you're looking to get a sub $100 CPU and a similarly priced DGPU, maybe a 750Ti or R737 maximally, then the pairing makes sense for the price as a whole. We've got a couple other charts for GTA 5, Dirt Rally, and The Witcher 3, all of which will appear briefly on screen, but check the article in the description below for more information on these individually and to learn about what our thoughts were on the results. Next is overclocking. The A80K isn't as hot an overclocker as some of AMD's FX chips, several of which can hit the 5 gigahertz mark pretty easily, but it does boast room for overclocking gains. We were able to achieve a maximum clock rate of 4.6 GHz on the 880K prior to irresolvable instability, and the performance disparity is generally minimal depending on game. Most games show about a 5-10% to performance gain, but on average sit around 7% faster in terms of frame rate when translating from the 4.6 GHz clock rate. Not too impressive overall, certainly not impressive compared against some of AMD's older chips. This isn't something I would recommend buying if you really want to get deep into overclocking and play around with high clock rates, but it is still easy to work with. You don't have to make major voltage changes to get that 4.6 gigahertz, and it's worth playing around with if you're curious about overclocking at a top level, but don't want to really push the CPU until it melts or dies. Don't expect enough frames to increase your bottom line on graphics settings with this overclocking for the 880K though. So is the 880K worth it? Well, it's in an interesting spot in the market. Sort of above it is the i3 range of Intel, and Intel's got that pretty on lock at the $130 to $150 price point from the i3 standpoint. They perform very well. In some games, there's like a 40% gap between this and the i3 that we tested, but that's a $50 price gap, so you've got to weigh that. And with that in mind, the place to look then is down. So down the SKU line, there's an AMD 860K, an 870K, 
And the 860K is the one that interests me the most because it's priced at about $80. This is supposed to be 95 ish, but it's generally 100, 105 on Newegg and Amazon right now. And that means that the 30 ish dollar gap, 20 to $35, between the 860K and the 880K is pretty significant. If I were building a machine that's sort of a budget, low spec gaming rig, and I wanted to devote as much money as possible to the GPU, what I would probably do is buy an 860K because you'll see fairly similar performance to this, especially if you look at the 760K that we benchmarked. Now, we didn't have an 860K for the bench, to be fair, but the 760K is a good indicator of performance. It falls between there and here, and I'm gonna be buying an 860K out of pocket in the future so that I can actually post a review of that with the team. But that's, that's stated and out of the way. The 860K makes better sense financially for a lot of budget builds. You can take that extra $30 and buy a significantly bolstered GPU. You might be moving from a 750Ti or R7370 card up to something that's more like maybe a 950, 960, maybe a 380, 380X, something in there. And that's a pretty big gain and you will actually get use out of that jump. The next thing to note, the 880K as it stands alone is pretty solid. It's, it's something that you would buy certainly instead of an APU if you're trying to build a, a sort of quote unquote proper gaming rig with a DGPU in it. There's really no reason for you to buy an APU if you're gonna throw a video card in there. And this is where you would go for the flagship end, the top end of that non-APU spectrum from AMD in the budget class. That's where you would certainly be falling. Still, I would be looking at the 860K as my primary budget class CPU. And then after that, I, I guess this fits in the middle range where if you've got enough to buy this, and a decent GPU, but not enough to buy an i3 and a decent GPU, you would buy this. But otherwise, I would be either 860K camp or sort of low-end i3 camp, just depending on what I'm trying to do with my rig. So overall, this performs pretty well. The thermals are reasonable, actually pretty good. The gaming performance is reasonable. It's equal to the APUs that we've tested. Those are really generally unexciting in terms of the gaps between the APUs and this CPU. They're all really within one to three FPS of each other. And that's not exciting to talk about, but it does mean that they're consistent and it does mean that there's really no reason to buy those for, in some cases, $30, $60 more than this thing. This makes much better sense for you as a DGPU user. But, you know, 30 bucks, you get an A6CK, still pretty darn good. There's a difference of a uh, couple hundred megahertz in the clock rate. That's really where you're paying for the gains in this thing for the most part. So if you wanted something that's similar to this, what I would suggest, 860K, overclock it a tiny bit if you feel like you can do it, and call it a day. That's a pretty darn good setup, and you do save a bit of money, put it towards a better GPU. So that is the conclusion on this. Overall, not bad, not as exciting as I was hoping it would be when looking at the APUs because I, you know, same architecture. So had a bit higher hopes, but did not disappoint too severely where we're condemning it. It's just right in the middle there between an AMD product 860K and an Intel product i3. That's where I stand on it. So as always, Patreon link, the post roll video. You can check the link in the description below for the article that covers this in full depth, maybe a bit more than we got here. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.